Very good, Fabian. Thanks for the kind introduction. And as Fabian said, don't hesitate to ask questions, raise your hand. I'm not offended if you stop me. This should be really interactive. So if you see something you don't understand or want me to elaborate, I'm happy to stop. Today's lecture is going to be about standard essential patents, um, a topic that is very close to my heart, as Fabian said. Um, I also was a PhD at the Chair of Innovation Economics. I also um, thereafter joined a, a university called uh, Serena Min Paris Tech in Paris to do a postdoc. So I did a PhD and a postdoc, but then um, um, actually wanted to be more practical. So I went on to found a company called IPlytics. Um, I will you know, tell you about that also later in that lecture, what we do in particular. Um, I still do a lot of um, lectures, though, um, not only at the TU Berlin, also at the University of Strasbourg, for example, also in Lausanne, um, also for the Paton Ilmenau, which, which is a German patent information office, and just recently also for the European Patent Office to teach about the world of standard essential patents. So I'm quite active still in teaching, which is a passion of mine. I'm, I'm, I'm really always happy to talk about topics that I care about. And the, the topic of standard central patents definitely is one of those. Um, we also have a great agenda today for that lecture. Um, I, will, I will really start from the very beginning uh, because I really want you to understand what a standard essential patent is um, with definitions even of the patent, but then go a bit uh, into more detail. Uh, and I also have um, a, a case study prepared for you. So you see an, at a practical example why standard central patents are so important. Um, and um, you know, I'll give you some insights really from the industry also what is happening there. So I'll start in the big, at the very beginning, what is a standard essential patents? And there is um, two definitions I like to quote here, typically. Um, let's give me one second, I'll move that further down. Um, the first definition is a standard essential patent is a patent that claims an invention that must be used to comply with a technical standard, right? That's the definition you would find on Wikipedia. So a patent, um, you know, has claims. Claims um, are basically parts of the invention that are new and novel and that involve a technical step. And these claims are always infringed or used when you implement a standard. Right, so that's the main definition. And by standard um, in this lecture, I mean a technical standard, something like a 5G standard or a wireless Wi-Fi standard or RFID, Bluetooth, NFC. These are all technology standards. So any device you see in the world that implements those standards also uses patents that have protected inventions that made the standard be the standard as it is today. So that is the definition of a so-called SEP, standard essential patent. A patent attorney would phrase that a bit different. A patent attorney would say an SEP, a standard essential patent, is a patent that has at least one independent claim of which each element can be mapped to the standard specification. So a patent attorney, just for you to know, these are people who did an engineering study typically. And in the case of you know, telecommunications, typically in you know, engineering telecommunications area. And then on top of that, they have a legal um, training. So these guys have the full technical understanding. These guys can actually read patents. So what is important, if you think about a patent body, you have the title abstract, the description, and then again, legally important are only the claims where the invention is really defined very specifically. And here, um, what we need only one claim that describes um, a technology, a method. Um, here, patent attorneys call it element. And that you know, small invention that you can map to a standard specification. And the standard specification is a document also sometimes 500 pages, for example, that specifies how to implement the technologies such as 5G. Um, and just visually how that looks like, um, we call that patent claim charting is that you go through a patent claim by claim, you know, they have numbers. Um, and then you look at the invention, look at the, the text corpus, and then try to map that to different sections in a technology specification standard. Um, and also it is quite complex um, here, just for your information, 5G, for example, has over 1,200 so-called technical specifications. So it's not one document, even it's several documents. Um, and we also have uh, hundreds of thousands of patents 
um, declared essential for 5G. So there's a lot of information in there. But to get started, I needed you to understand, you know, what a standard essential patent is in legal terms and in technical terms. But I want to go even one step back further. Um, what is a patent? Because that, you know, explains a bit the controversy around standard central patent. A patent is an exclusive right granted by a sovereignty state, meaning a patent office, basically, you can have a European patent, for example, for Europe, or designated states in Europe, you can have a US patent as a USPDO. And that gives you uh, or the inventor gives gives it the right an exclusive right for a limited period of time, typically 20 years, um, in exchange for that you make your invention public. Right, so you have an invention. You invented the wheel. You go to the patent office, let's say to the European Patent Office, um, and you get granted a patent. Right, and you have now twenty years that no one else can use that technology because you own the patent. So the main intent is to allow its owner to exclude others from using your pr protected invention. Right, this is the main intent of a patent. But now. Let's look at the definition of a technology standard. Technology standards are common platforms or specifications of a technology to connect, communicate, and work on a common basis. Here, the main intent is to encourage the spread and the wide implementation of the standardized technology. And that is true. You know, we want as fast as possible everyone to use 5G because it's faster, it's more efficient, um, you know, it, it's more stable. Um, so the adoption of a standard. Um, and the whole standards development is there that everyone uses the same technology. Um, so the intent is really to encourage the use, while a patent intends to exclude others from, from the use. So we have a patent, which is exclusive, and a standard, which is inclusive, right? The totally opposite. So how does that work together? How does a patent, can a patent be securing a standard that should be used by anyone? We did a study since oh, back then when I was still a PhD at the at the um, at the um, Technical University of Berlin, and we also in that regard asked the top five motives to patent. And again, from that definition, you know the, the answers were quite straightforward. The main intention is to include others from using your patented invention, to differentiate from the market, and to have freedom to operate. While we asked that same question in terms of why would you set a standard and you know go to standards development meetings and you know involve your staff there. Um, we got the answers of in, the intention is to communicate, to work on a common basis, to encourage the spread and implementation of the standard. So again, the, also the motives to file patents and to develop the standards are the totally opposite, right? How do we solve this? The solution that people came up with is called FRAND. FRAND stands, or that abbreviation actually, it stands for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. What does that actually mean? If you file a patent, and that patent is essential to a standard, a so-called standard essential patent, you actually do not have the typical patent rights that you would have with a, let's say, normal patent because you don't have the exclusive right to exclude others from using it. In fact, you must allow others to use it. And that makes a lot of sense because if I own a patent on 5G and I don't allow anyone to use it, let's say I'm the company Apple, then Apple is the only phone that runs on 5G and everyone else is excluded, right? So that wouldn't make sense. Um, so basically what you have, you have to make your patent available. But of course, you can ask for money. You can ask for compensation, um, which is called a mandatory license. So, well, I'm, you know, I cannot exclude you from using the patent. Well, fair enough, but I can ask for money. But that is now a problem. How much money is reasonable here, right? And that is why they implemented a framework called FRAND. And FRAND includes basically three concepts. The first one is fair. And fair means um, two things mainly, no bundling. So license must include only SCPs. I give you an example. Let's say Apple owns 10 standard essential patents, right? Um, but they also own 10 design patents on their latest you know, visual interface. Now Samsung comes along and says, great, Apple, um, you know, your 10 SCPs, your 10 standard essential patents on 5G, you know, you, you're mandatory, have to license them to me, um, give them to me. And Apple says, sure, you know, I know, I have to license them to you, but I have a package for you. 
It includes 10 standard central patents and 10 design patents. And that's a bundle and that's illegal. You cannot just create a package, including non-essential patents, making it more expensive, obviously. Um, this, is, this is not, you know, this wouldn't be fair as to that definition. Another situation is free grant backs. This is also illegal. What does that mean? It basically means same situation, Apple owns 10 standard essential patents, Samsung comes along and asks, hey, great, Apple, give me access to your 10 essential patents. Some, uh, Apple says, great, I give you access, but I don't even ask for money. I want to give, get access to your latest you know, display design patents. You know, those 10 patents that secure this great Samsung screen, uh, if you give me access to those patents, you get my standard essential patents. That is a free grant back that's also illegal, right? You can ask for money only, right? A compensation must be money. Of course, you can get a gentleman's agreement with Samsung and they give you access to their patents. Everything is possible in the open market, but you cannot, you know, basically enforce it and tell them to get access somewhere. So that would be a grant back. So FAIR basically includes no bundling and no free grant backs. And that is actually a quite straightforward rule, right? You can actually, you know, define, monitor, and it's quite transparent. The second one, reasonable, is the most debated and often, you know, very famously litigated case of a reasonable license. And reasonable means a price, actually the dollars you have to pay for getting access to those patents. Um, and there's many discussions about it. I will also in this lecture talk about this again. But the main problem here is that you can have different definitions of how much value, let's say a technology of 5G brings to a phone, because we can all agree, a phone that cannot connect to 4G and 5G is worth nothing, right? At least if you step out of your apartment where you have Wi-Fi outside on the streets, you need access to internet because anything you do with your phone these days needs internet. Oh, let's say maybe there's some, some games that are not online yet, but you know, apart from that, um, it's useless. So, you know, how much value does it bring to your phone? And that's a big discussion. And the final, um, the final part of FRAND is non-discriminatory terms. That means basically Apple and Samsung are obviously competitors. So Apple cannot ask for more money for those patents compared to, let's say, a supplier of Apple who is a friend of them, right? They cannot discriminate prices. So they have to ask for the same price no matter if it's a competitor or let's say a supplier. So that's also something that can be tracked at least. Um, so if you think about the problem of FRAND, it's mainly the definition of what's really reasonable. And that's FRAND, that's when we call, talk about FRAND. So um, the next um, topic I wanna talk about is to give you some more insights on how actually the filing um, and invention and in R&D of a company that is also actively um, developing standards works. Because standards development, to give you, an, up, uh, uh, to give you um, an idea, is nothing that you do just once. You know, it's not like, oh, 5G, we ratify 5G, now this is 5G, over, you know, done. That's not the case. It's an evolving work. They, by the way, still also work on in improving 4G, right? Because everyone still uses 4G. There's still technical development on 4G. And so will be on 5G. 5G has been started to be developed in 2015. So approximately six years ago, and it's evolving. It's, it's, it's been improving and there's different releases and different versions of 5G. Um, and that is also why, and you have to imagine it in a way that a company sends their engineers, so teams to different conferences. These days, these are, of course, also virtual, but back in the days before COVID, there were really conferences taking place in New York, in Tokyo, in Shanghai, in Berlin, you know, international, so that, you know, every um, territory has a conference of these, and then all these international standards developments would, would meet at the conference and present the latest technical advances, let's say, in 5G. So a guy from Nokia presents the latest encryption. A guy from Apple presents the latest transmission technology. A guy from Huawei um, presents the latest um, exchange of um, uh, base stations. So you have all these experts coming around from the world. They go to these meetings, they present their research. And the research they present has been patented beforehand because in a way you want your patented technology to be part of the standard because actually having a standard essential patent is a very lucrative market. Getting license you know, 
um, money or income royalties we call that is, is 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 a lot of money and we're talking hundreds of millions of money for that and think about a company like nokia nokia has more than 50 percent of their revenue these days coming from standard essential paths they don't have any devices as you know they still have base stations but apart from that it's all technology they sell and that comes from standard essential paths <coughs> so in this visual that you see here you see that standards development evolves over time. We have different releases. Releases get amended. And among that, also patents are filed. So it's a dynamic process of people going to these meetings, presenting their research. Then there's voted, then the, the standards development groups vote on which of the presentations and input and contributions to include. And then they agree and approve these contributions. And you know, those companies have patents, and they then see those patents being standard essential. But let's look at a company internally. How are companies these days structured and what divisions and departments work on inventions, patents, and standards? <clears throat> Think about a company like Apple, Samsung, Huawei, ZTE, Panasonic, companies that are actively developing standards such as 5G. Of course, they have an R&D research department. And in R&D, typically, you come up with a new invention it is an invention that relates to 5G. Um, and then internally, the teams think about, is this invention something we could patent? So the R&D person, the researcher, doesn't make that decision. He actually only submits to the patent department his invention disclosure. Why would he do that? Because he gets a lot of compensation for it. Most companies have a system where Inventors get a lot of money when their inventions get patented, even more when they become essential patents. So what that person does, the inventor, he submits his invention to something called the patent review board. And the patent review board is part of the IP management team. And those guys, they meet on typically weekly basis. They get inventions. They look at those inventions. First of all, is it novel? Is it technical? Just broadly. And then, of course, very importantly, is it something commercially relevant to us? You know, does it protect our products? Could it be a standard essential patent? These kind of things. If it is, the first thing they do is very quickly, they submit that invention to the patent office, whatever office you typically do. When we talk about standard essential patents, it is most likely um, not a local office, meaning you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have a German patent. You would have directly an English patent you submit to the EPO or USPTO. In the US, we call it provisional. Uh, in, in Germany, actually, it's a priority patent. And the reason why you directly send it, the minute you send it and the minute the patent office receives this, you have the priority. You were the first to file um, that, that invention. <clears throat> On parallel, let's say that new invention is part of 5G. Um, the R&D also discusses that invention with the standards development group. And they say, oh, that is great. Um, we have to present that at the next standards development meeting. But before they are allowed to do it, you know, the patent review board gives a green light. Yes, we have patented this invention, or we have at least submitted it. That's enough. You have to submit it, then you're good. Only then they, they're allowed to present it at the meetings, because otherwise you give your invention out for free. If you haven't filed a patent and you present it somewhere, everyone can use it. You know, it's, it's open. But that's why they are strategic about it. They, they, they file patents first, then they go to the meeting. At the meetings, they present the invention. There's a voting procedure. Let's say, you know, everything went well. You know, that invention becomes part of the standard then we have the first standard version. That first standard version, a patent attorney can take and say, okay, great, we have this first provisional invention submitted to the office. I can try to create the first claim chart to see if it really is essential on the final version of the standard. Because of course, there's input from many other companies and it may change from the initial thought and invention of idea. There's, however, in the patent office, some other vehicles or features, I call it, that you can still, your initial idea, can change because your initial idea is really a description. It's not a real patent yet. So the drafting of the actual claims you can do later. And of course, that is that can be used strategically. So we can look at the you know, development of the standard. So we have that first version we set, but then we have a final version that is maybe different to the first version. And maybe it goes a little bit further away from your initial invention. What you can still do is you can amend your claims. You can change your claims accordingly so it better is chartable and mappable on the final standard. And that's, of course, what companies do. 
So they have a final claim chart, they change the claims, amend the claims, and in the end, they have the allowance of a, of a patent, meaning a patent gets granted, and that's what we call the filing or the prosecution process. And if everything goes as planned, so we have the invention, we have filed the first provisional priority, we have amended our claims to the final standard version, if all that has worked, we have a standard essential patents. And in order to make money out of a standard essential patents, there are mainly three things you consider doing. First of all, you keep the patent and you license it, right? It's a lot of money you can get for the patent. Um, if you are a player yourself, let's say you're Apple, you are in the market, of course you have to cross license a lot because you own central patents, Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, Huawei, they all own essential patents. So in the end, the person who has more patents pays less because you can cross license, you can exchange patents for patent. If someone is using 5G and is not paying, you go and litigate, right? You go to courts and you enforce your patents and say, you're using my patent and invention. I need to be compensated. Give me the money. If all that seems too hurdlesome for you and some companies are just not, you know, they don't like to litigate, they don't like to enforce, what they do is they sell their patents because selling is also quite lucrative. You know, you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single patent. And they sell those patents typically to companies that have specialized to enforce patents. Some people call these companies patent assertion entities. Others call them patent trolls or patent sharks. There's a question, Elena. Yes, it's, uh, as I understood, the standard version in the 3DB, for example, yeah. it's a group project, but the patent is only a of the inventor. So if, how does it work if the changes are from a group, but the ownership is only from one inventor? Yeah, I think in, in the end, you have to understand that a final standard is um, comes from input from a lot of people, as you said, from a group. So several people submit something and it's a mix of different you know pro proposals in the end, right? Let's say, Ericsson, Nokia, Apple, and Samsung propose something, it might be that all their inventions become the standard, right? So we have four proposals of companies uh, and inventors, and they all become in the end one standard. And they all own individual patents to the standard. And that's what we call standard essential patents. And that is actually also how it works in, real, in the real world. So it is very often that several standards from different patent owners are essential to one standard if that answers the question. Yeah, I suppose that uh, then in, with the claim amendments in the, in the patent office, you end with a fragmented pattern so we can fit the standard. Yeah, um, and that is how they strategically do it. You are right about one thing. A patent office is always local. A standard is international, right? So what c companies do, and it's a bit more complex, they don't only file that patent in Europe or at the USPDO. They have to file it in China. They have to file it in Japan and Korea. Mainly those big, we call them IP5, those big offices, they file those patents because that's where they sell the smartphones and the, you know, the cars and things. So you're right, you have to go to the local offices, each of these offices and file and demand your claims. And these claims may be different across offices also. So it's, it's a bit complex. Great, um, very good. There um, is actually one research paper I recommend you reading if you're interested in this, and it comes from Professor Blinn, actually. Um, he worked uh, with um, uh, Florian Berger and Nikolaus Thum on a, uh, on a paper called Fighting Behavior Regarding Essential Patents, and they found what I just presented to you. Um, they basically confirmed that empirically. For example, SEPs are amended around 25% more often than other patents, or SEPs have significantly more claims, right? These are typical characteristics of a patent being, you know, strategically used in drafting the claims. And also they found out that the time until a final decision about a patent application becomes an actual patent is much longer than for other patents, comparable patents, because they want to keep the filing open. And you can do that with the patent office. You have certain flexibility in your communication with the patent office to keep your invention open before it's granted. Um, and the longer it's open, the, the longer you can amend your claims to the final standard. Um, and 
and also they find that this is actually in chronological order to the actual standards development. So they have a lot of cross correlations of patent filing and standards development, which is, I think, quite interesting. And we can confirm that, by the way, also with data we created at IPlytics, but that was the initial paper. It's been always, you know, nine years ago now, only 10 years even, when they wrote that paper. But yeah, that's something I recommend reading. So let's talk about standards. Um, I keep giving you the example of 5G, which is, of course, you know all that, but um, there's, of course, more standards subject to so-called standard essential patents. Um, connectivity standards are standards like 3G, 4G, 5G, but also um, another very important and heavily patented one is Wi-Fi. And also Wi-Fi, as you may know, has different generations. Right now, Wi-Fi 6 is in the market, which is the latest generation of Wi-Fi technology. We also have um, a technology called um, video coding, um, which is basically any video, you know, the screen sharing we're doing right now is using that technology because I'm recording my video with an HD camera, but I'm not transmitting that HD quality to you. It is, and you know, we, we basically, um, we have a codec that reduces and compresses the video and sends it to you in a much smaller compression and then decompresses it again. So you see the, the high definition video. That technology is also one very important and more and more used in any smartphone, in any you know, streaming of Netflix or whatever you, you do is using one of these so-called video standards. Also, they have generations AVC, HEVC, and the latest one is VVC. And also that one is heavily patented. Just to give you three examples, I told you in the beginning, there's more, there's Bluetooth, there is NFC, there's RFID. Um, there's a lot of other standards that are relevant or subject to so-called standard essential patent. What has changed, however, is that I would say 10 years, 15 years ago, these standards were typically used in the computer and smartphone world, you know, laptops, tablets, smartphones, that kind of devices. However, nowadays, that is different. Um, more and more, these technology and connectivity, and some people call that IoT technologies, are used across many other industry verticals. And that creates more challenges, and that makes these standard central patents even more important. You know, the one and the first that is affected by connectivity is the transportation. I don't know how many of you do um, things like um, car sharing, but if you open a car share, you know, a car that you just rented um, with your phone, if you open that, you open that with your phone, right? And that uses um, typically 4G these days, um, and the car opens because a signal has been sent from your phone to the base station back to the car. Um, before you could, you could open it with a phone, by the way, you could use a card, um, typically NFC. NFC you can also use for payment. Um, however, um, the car and the vehicle is probably the first um, that integrates a lot of connectivity standards. Um, and th this includes not only 4G, 5G, it includes also within the car, devices connect via Bluetooth. You know, you have videos in the car infotainment. Um, you have, for example, um, the charging of your phone, the, the, the wireless charging, that's a standard. It's called the Qi standard. Um, you know, newer models of cars have that. And it goes beyond transportation, of course, home appliances. We talk about smart TVs, smart kitchens, smart refrigerators. They all connect to your Wi-Fi, to your Alexa, all through standards. Um, industrial manufacturing, we have automation in factories. We have robotics that use connectivity standards to communicate. Uh, in the energy market, we have smart metering, smart grids, smart solar, you know, and, and even in healthcare, there is this idea of a remote surgery that they work on that, for example, a doctor at the MIT in Boston is doing a surgery in building um, through video sharing, through handling instruments, um, through technology like 5G or, or Wi-Fi technology. All industry verticals will be affected by connectivity and connectivity is, you know, the backbone of connectivity are these technology standards that we talk about, and all of these are heavily patented. So you see how important those technologies are to the industries and to the market. To give you some idea of the numbers um, and also IPlytics, because I haven't talked about the company I founded, but we are a data analytics company, and we gather data on technology standards and patents and so-called standard essential patents. If you think about worldwide filed patents, we have over 120 million of those patents. You know, we can track them in the different patent offices across US, Europe, and the Asia markets. Um, if you think about 
patents declared as standard essential, we have over 30 different standards organizations and 11 patent pools that provide information on which patents have been declared essential, um, including FRAND commitments, for example. And we also integrate the world of technology standards, which integrates the actual standards documents, but also before it becomes a final standard, also the drafts of documents and the so-called contributions so can really track down individual companies on how much they actually were part of the standards development process. So we can track that down into to that actually detailed level. To give you some data, um, these are patent families declared for 5G or for 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G, um, newly declared every year. And you see, um, just last year, we had over 15,000 patent families declared for 5G. 5G is the most patented generation, even though it isn't even yet implemented anywhere. Um, it's much more patented than 4G, as you see here in green, uh, compared to 3G and 2G. Uh, of course, it's in the recent years of 5G development, but you see that um, the number of 5G patents is really the highest. If you think about the companies that own these patents, you see that um, also here we have you know, more and more dominant players from the Asian market. So Huawei is, is the worldwide company that declares most patents for 5G and 4G, uh, followed by a US company called Qualcomm, Samsung, number three, ZTE, another Chinese company, LG from Korea, Nokia from Finland, CATT Datang Mobile from China, Ericsson, Oppo, another Chinese company. So you see a lot of Asian companies in here um, that, you know, especially in the in the past, I would say five to 10 years, just joined the market and are now the heavy patent owners of the latest 5G technology. Another very important technology is the different Wi-Fi generations. As I told you, uh, we differentiate between Wi-Fi 4, 5, 6, and an upcoming one called 7. Again, we have Huawei and Qualcomm being number one and number two here. Other companies in include then in the tops is Intel, Broadcom, LG, MediaTek. Um, and as you see, different companies also have, you know, different contribution levels across the different generations. So some enter the market and some also uh, leave the market. Um, and you see also the, the this, these were the standards contributions. And then in the patent filing world, we also have the universe of so-called Wi-Fi 6 patent filings. Just to give you some numbers and to, to make you understand which companies are involved here. Um, but how does the actual licensing of um, standard essential patent work. You have to imagine different cases here. Um, we have on the left-hand side companies that develop the standard, they go to the standards meetings and that file the patents. These are the so-called standard essential patent owning companies. And you can imagine another group of companies that are not developing the standards, but they implement the standards. They create devices that say, think about a Berlin startup that creates smart um, smartwatches, right? Uh, and of course, that smartwatch is going to implement 5G because the smartwatch should communicate with your phone, communicate with a cloud service that tracks your data because you want to track your health and whatever steps you take. Um, so that startup from Berlin is the typical implementer. So if that startup from Berlin wants to have access to those patents, they can get a license and we call that license out because the SAP owners license to that one single company that has no patents, all they do want to do is they want to implement it to standardized technology, in this case, 5G. The more common case, however, especially across the big players, is that those companies who develop the standard are typically also those companies that implement the standard. And I'm talking about companies like Apple, you, you know, Samsung, Huawei, um, LG, um, you know, Vivo, Napo, you know, the new Chinese companies that have handset devices, those companies heavily implement standardized technologies in their smartphone and their handsets, but they also develop the standard. So the typical case is actually that we see uh, when licensing SEPs is a cross license. So we have Samsung licensing to Apple, both Samsung and Apple have developed 5G. You know, it's just a question of who has more and who has a better and more valuable portfolio. That's what we call cross-license. To make everything much more easier, um, the market came up with a third solution. That's what we call a pool license. And the idea of a pool license is you put everything in a pool, all patents essential in a pool, and the patent owners don't have to care about it anymore. The pool administrator takes care of the licensing and licenses to all implementers a pool license, a one-stop license. I'll talk about um, pools in a minute. 
Um, there are certain rules um, when you know you enter a licensing negotiation, and it is very legal. Um, and I'm not uh, an attorney myself. I'm not a legal person myself. But the five-step rule is here one. I, I quoted the source here that they defined. And typically, the way it works is if you are, let's say, you are that Berlin startup with your smartwatch, the SAP holder um, must give a notice that you're using the patented technology. So basically, let's say Nokia, you know, informs that startup, hey, you are implementing 5G. Fair enough. You're also using my patents. So please give me, you know, the royalties. Um, the the alleged infringer, that Berlin startup, must then answer it to that request and say, yes, I want to get a license under FRAN terms. I said, these must be fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory. And then third step is then the SAP holder must provide a written license offer. So they must ask a specific price, very specific on the royalty and how it's calculated. How did they come up with it? I give you an example. Samsung's uh, Nokia says we own a thousand 5G patents. That is 20% of all 5G patents, and I want you know 10% um, of your revenue. So that is a, something they could ask for. Oh, there's a question, Luis. Yes, hello. Um, my question is, um, in the case that, for example, we're building up that watch. Um, and you're buying a, I'm not sure this is how it works, but for example, a 5G, 5G chips chip from a producer. Right. Um, I'm wondering just, uh, I, as a consumer, I will not pay for the patent or I will pay it via my subscription in a way, but then who in the line of production is considered responsible? Exactly. Yeah. That is a great question. Um, in the end, everyone is, right? I mean, legally, the chip manufacturer that just delivers the chip to the Berlin startup that develops the smartwatch is infringing the patent the same as a smartwatch producer themselves. However, what we see is that the SAP owners always go to the OEM, to the original equipment manufacturers, to, to the last point of the value chain. In this case, the startup from Berlin that sells the device. The, the person, you know, the, the individual buying a, a, a product is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's buying a product um, with understanding that they have the rights to use it. But even there, they could be banned from using it. Theoretically, it doesn't happen. But again, um, so what, what happens in the market is that the producer of the final product, the so-called OEM, is the one that get, gets approached. Uh, and that, of course, um, company could claim and go into regression to the chip manufacturer and said, I'm, I'm paying here a lot of money on a chip you sold me. Um, so I, I want your money back. So there's these discussions within the value chain. And it's a great question, Louise, because this is actually what, what's happening right now in a lot of cases um, that are litigated in the automotive industry. Because in the automotive industry, um, we have the same case, but here it's not, you know, the, the Continentals or the Bushes that are approached. It's Mercedes, Daimler, uh, BMW, uh, Volkswagen. Um, those are the company that are right now targeted in litigation or targeted in paying a license for standard essential patents. Thank you. Um, so yeah, back to this. So um, uh, number three, um, SCP holder must give a written offer. Number four, the in alleged infringer must respond, um, accepting the offer or making a counter offer. And also what the company must do is provide appropriate security payments. So put differently, if you ask me for yearly, let's say a hundred million euros of license fees, I must make those security payments, um, appropriate security um, uh, payments or save the money somewhere so that I plan in to, to pay you at some point when we find a solution, right? The, the five steps here sound quite straightforward, but in reality, it goes back and forth a lot. You know, the communication between the alleged infringer and the SEP owner. Um, and it, and, and um, it's, it's almost what people say, it's like you go forward and you go backwards. It, it looks like a dance. And that's what we call, or people in the industry call it the friend dance. It's also a, an expression used a lot because it goes back and forth, right? I give you an offer, you give me a counter offer. I think it's not fair and not reasonable. And you give me arguments back and forth. If, if all that doesn't work, we go to litigation. That's unfortunate how it works typically. Let's talk about 
not, you know, that, that what I told you is, is a, a typical bilateral license negotiation. But how does it work for a patent pool? Again, we put all patents in the pool and the, 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 the pool administrator takes care of it. So, you know, all the patents, you know, essential, let's say to 5G, enter a pool, um, which is basically a, a, an individual entity that was created just to license patents. And they get the patents from Apple, from Samsung, Nokia, Ericsson, from all these SAP owners. They get the patents, they create one contract and the startup from Berlin that creates a smartwatch, same as Daimler who you know, ships worldwide um, you know, Mercedes cars um, that use 5G, they go to that patent pool and they get access to the patents. And it's much easier because if you think about it, and I showed you the, the, the data, we have um, over a hundred actually patent owners that own patents for 5G. You don't wanna go to all these individual patent owners. It's much more easier to go to a patent pool, to one stop, as they call it, one stop shop. However, Pool creation, pool setup um, by economists is seen as very positive, but it, it also has its, its downsides to it. But let's think about an economist. Um, the economist, and I am actually one of those guys that looked at efficiencies. And of course, it is very easy to, to identify a patent pool as very efficient. First of all, the most obvious is transaction cost. If I have to go to Apple, Samsung, Huawei, uh, all these different players individually, I have to create, let's say, 10 different contracts and negotiate 10 different contracts, which is a lot of money I have to pay my lawyers. Not very efficient. Going to one patent pool is much more efficient. So the transaction costs are much more reduced. There's another economic thinking behind it, which is called the multiple marginalization problem. It's basically the idea that every patent owner, without the knowledge of how much patents the others own, overestimates his share. So we had the case of Nokia discussing a license with the Berlin startup, and Nokia claims they have 10% of the worldwide 5G patents, while in reality, they only own 5%, right? The reason is Nokia doesn't know how, many, how much patents all the others have. And of course, rather than underestimating their portfolio, they're overestimating. Um, but it, taken together, if everyone overestimates their portfolio, you end up at above 100%, right? And that's what we call in economics, the double marginalization or multiple marginalization problem that you know, if we share a license um, and we share the cake, uh, the cake is, is is bigger than a cake, right? I mean, uh, if Nokia asks for 10% while they in reality own 5%, they're asking double of, of what they should ask for. And if everyone does it, we have two cakes, even though there's just one. If that makes it, you know, clear. Um, so that would, a patent pool creates transparency. A pool gets all the patent together. They find a system to evaluate these patents and they know how much share Nokia has in Apple and Samsung and so on. <clears throat> Another point is clear blocking positions. So obviously what a pool can do is if all patents are secured under one pool license, we get access to 5G much easier and that clears blocking positions that maybe single patent owners may not want to license or ask for extraordinary amounts of money. You know, that, that clears these blocking positions. And of course, a patent pool also often has a marketing role as they facilitate the technology because they need to, to collect the money. So they, make, they have to also make the technology uh, or, or they have an incentive that everyone uses the technology. So they help to facilitate it. And to give you some examples of very famous patent pools, but the very first one 20, over 20 years ago, is MP3, very successful patent pool. Some of you know that Fraunhofer was part of it and other companies like Philips and Panasonic then we had other um, uh, video and, and, and audio codec pools, MPAC, DVD is, was also a pool. No one is using DVD anymore, but it was also back then successful. Also the video codec, um, AVC and HVC have pools and also 3G, 4G, and now there's even a pool for 5G. But it's a particular pool I'll talk about later. But there's also cost. Oh, there's a question, Eric. <clears throat> Uh, yes, I was just wondering whether these uh, pools, because uh, it, it read there in the slide that it was like between members, but is it like usual that the members itself create the pool and also market and and uh, like uh, manage the pool, or is it usually third party, uh, like a third party business? No, it's. It's, it's of course, I mean, you need alignment across the patent owners. So you're right, you know, Apple have to, have to get alignment with Samsung and everyone to set up a pool or to 
you know, get their patent submitted to it. But the idea really is to have a third entity, an independent entity that administers and runs the pool. And this is also good for the patent owners because they don't have to worry about it anymore, right? They don't, at least in theory, they give the patents to the pool and they manage everything, right? They enforce it, they, they search for licenses, they get the money. And once they have the money, they redistribute it to the patent owner. So the idea is really to outsource it to a pool. So that's the, really the idea. In reality, it's not exactly 100% like that, but um, that's the idea of a pool. And that's actually a good question, Eric, because it goes now to the costs. Um, what are the costs of setting up a pool? Well, the costs are, first of all, worn by the SEP owners because they have incentives to set it up. So they must put ideas and work into it. Um, and it's, it, there's a lot of work to set up a patent pool. First of all, you have to think about that if you create a pool, all patent owners have to agree on license conditions that are you know, the same for everyone. Put differently, we all must agree on a certain price the patented technology must have, right? So even within SEP owners, there are different ideas about it because there's different business behind it. Think about a business um, like Apple, right? Most of their business is selling their iPhones and tablets and smartwatches. They don't have much money that comes in from patent licensing. And even if they have income from patent licenses, it is compared to all the other money they make. Also, I didn't even mention the app store. It's a tiny, tiny bit, right? So Apple's interest is that everyone is using 5G. And the more you use it, the more devices they sell. So the interest is on the device market. Let's say we look at a company called Qualcomm. Qualcomm is one of the largest chip manufacturers. They create the small chip that makes 5G you know, run on your phone. They already have a much different idea about it, right? I mean, of course, they also have interest that more devices get sold, but they also need to make a considerable much of money with the patented technology, right? So they have an interest that the SEPs are much more expensive than maybe Apple has. And then we have a third company called Interdigital that is almost a pure technology company. They don't even produce hardware. They All they do is they do research and development. They contribute in the standards development also. They're an innovative company, but they don't produce anything. So the only income stream they have is through patent licensing. That's the only income stream. So they have an incentive to make it very expensive. And we even have another group of companies, the carriers, you know, Orange or T-Mobile or um, AT&T. Uh, they have an interest that um, more and more people use the, 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 the networks, right? More and more phones are sold. And they, they also don't care about license income. They make a lot of money, again, with um, contracts sold of getting access to the internet. And the more you know, 5G we have, the more contracts are sold, the more expensive you can make it. So also they have a totally... So all of these different business models now come together you know, at, at, at one, in one patent pool and they have to agree on license. And that is the big challenge. Um, Eric, we'll see now. Uh, yeah, you just mentioned that um, different SAP holders have different um, imaginations for, for values of their uh, respective patents. Um, I was wondering because um, it also is supposed to adhere to the front terms, right? Uh, especially the, the aspect of reasonability. Um, how exactly is that defined reasonability? So, I mean, um, Maybe R&D costs, maybe all just agree on a price, uh, um, but it seems very vague and uh, there's a lot of room for interpretation. You are right. It, it is vague also, and that's the, the problem. And as it is vague because it also depends on the application. You know, how much value does 5G bring to your smartphone compared to your tablet is already very different, right? Because your tablet, you typically use more at home than if you go out. So that is already a difference. But now think about how much value does 5G bring to your refrigerator? It's probably much less. It's probably just gambling with it. I don't know. You get a picture of the inside of your refrigerator when you're shopping. That's nice. That's a gadget. But it's not, you know, nothing that makes your refrigerator much more valuable. Again, a phone without 5G is not worth anything. How much does value does 5G give to a car? Nowadays, it's what is it? Navigation, um, telematics, um, some infotainment, but not much. But let's say in 10 years time when the car drives fully autonomously or party autonomously, communicating with the traffic, 
you know, communicating with traffic lights, with other cars, that value of 5G may increase much more to a car, right? Because it's more connected. So, you know, the definition of how much value the technology brings to a product is not only depending on the product and the application, but also goes will change over time, right? It will change when IoT is more integrated in a car, it will have much more value than it has today. Today, a car without 5G is probably also one you would buy, right? You, you think, oh, it would be nice to have it, but it still drives, right? I mean, it still does everything you need. Um, while I think in 10 years time, if you're getting used to your car is almost driving autonomously, maybe it is driving autonomously, there's no way to have a car without 5G. So it really depends on how much value it brings. So, and, and you're right, it's vague. And that's also why we have a lot of litigation in the space that some people say, it must be $15 per car, and others say it must be $7 per car, right? Um, Eric with K, another question. Um, yes, uh, building on, on this one just now, uh, you said early, earlier when introducing the friend principles that Apple, for example, couldn't discriminate against their competitors, Samsung, by um, making it more expensive than for everyone else. But does it mean that uh, your example of the uh, smartwatch producer or the, the small uh, startup, smartwatch startup, uh, has to pay the same uh, licensing fee or amount for, for the patents as Samsung does, for example? Yeah, of course, it must be comparable because Samsung owns standard central patents themselves. So, of course, Samsung, you know, because they cross license with Apple, pay much less in reality. And that, that's only fair because they own patents and Apple and they cross license. So it, it must be non-discriminatory when it's comparable. Mm -hmm. So the smart the, the smartwatch um, company from Berlin must pay the same price as Daimler, right? Um, because they're both, you know, but again, it's already different products. So maybe a comparable would be Daimler pays as much as BMW and Volkswagen. So that is a good, better comparison. Um, they all do not own standard central patents themselves. They're all in the same situation. So they, they must be comparable. Um, while, for example, if you think about Huawei, Huawei is a supplier of many automotive companies. You could think that Huawei, for example, who are you know, um, 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 sub supplying, let's say to Toyota a lot, um, gives Toyota a much better price than BMW who doesn't work with Huawei, right? They don't have a business race. And that's the typical market situations that shouldn't be non-discriminatory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Good, great. Yeah, back to the patent pool um, topic. So again, different business models, different ideas of a price. Um, there's also, um, you know, I mean, to, to be honest, in reality, not all SCP owners join a pool. It's always a fraction of the market. So the pool typically never covers 100%. And it is sometimes for companies attractive to have a pool in the market, but stay out of the pool, because then your patent portfolio may still be, you know, not as visible and transparent. And um, the pool license typically is smaller due to the double marginalization problem. So you can ask for higher prices. So there's, there's a lot of strategic um, decision-making in that. And in the very end, setting up a pool is a chicken and egg problem, because um, of course you have to set it up. You have to find first joiners, and then you, you have other companies that stay out. So it's always, you know, that um, uh, a challenge to overcome. We back then, and I'm, I'm sorry, the data is, hasn't been updated, we, but we looked at the effectiveness of pools and how many pools that try to be set up actually were successful because there have been a lot of launches of pools that never picked up. The pool never existed. They asked for licensors and SCP owners to join, but no one joined. Um, again, the first successful one in 1990 was the MP3, um, you know, the blue colored are the successful ones, but then we had a lot of tries to set up pools for 3G and 4G in 2004 and 2006, and they all failed because of the different business models I just explained. Um, so, you know, the Qualcomm's and Apple's and Samsung's and Orange and T-Mobile's and Interdigital and Qualcomm, they, they all didn't come to a, um, a price you know, they couldn't agree on a price. So the major SAP owners didn't join. And that's why also the pool wasn't attractive in the end. We have a um, interesting pool that has been set up just, um, you know, a, a few years back. <clears throat> um, it's called Avanci. And Avanci um, actually has more than 50% of all 3G, 4G, 5G patent owners in the pool. Interestingly, however, Avanci only licenses to the automotive industry. 
So they wouldn't license to the Berlin smartwatch startup. They also wouldn't license to a handset manufacturer that sells phones. They only license, it was only set up to get money from the automotive industry for the 2G, 3G and 4G and 5G is, is not set up yet, but will be this year. And that's quite interesting. So a patent pool that is only selling or licensing to one industry vertical, in this case, the automotive. Again, even that, even, I mean, this is the largest share of SEPs ever in the telecommunications world they got, but still um, they only got some members. On the left-hand side, the members are including, you know, Nokia, Philip, Siemens, Sharp, Sony, um, big players really um, that own such a patents, but also big players stayed out. Huawei, Samsung, Google, um, they all stayed out, Apple, out of the pool. They didn't want to, you know, license through the pool. So we estimated at roughly 50%. The data is also not 100% updated. So it, I think they are up to 60, 70% these days. So people are keep joining, but still, it's still a fraction, not a fraction, but it's still a share of the whole market. We have a very similar situation with, an, with another patent pool, uh, which is called the HEVC um, pool. We had three patent pools in the market and outsiders. So if you want to get access to the video coding technology HEVC, you have to go to the MPEG LA pool. You know, members here include Apple, Canon, Siemens. Um, then we had the HEVC advanced pool, now called XS Advanced, which included Philips, Huawei, GE. And then we had the so-called Velos Media Pool, which included Qualcomm, BlackBerry, Sharp, Panasonic. Why three pools? Three pools have three different prices. Velos, for example, had a, had a very expensive price because the patent owners in that pool wanted to get a lot of return from their patented solutions. While Access Advance and mpeg -LA were considered to be more moderate in pricing. And then we had the fourth group of companies that stayed out of, of all three pools. They licensed bilaterally because they may ask a lot more money in the end. So that's quite an interesting situation here and very fragmented. <clears throat> so we could even have for one technology standards, three pools. Um, we estimated that around um, still over 73% are you know, covered through those three pools that you saw. So still a good share of the market. <coughs> and the share among the pools some, looks like this. So you see, licensing SAPs is a very complex issue. And why complex? Because there's a lot of money at stake. Um, Fabian, a question. Yeah, also a question from my side. Actually, what is the motivation of a company to join a patent pool when it's only partially covering the standard and when it's very obvious that a lot of standard essential patent owners are not part of the pool because basically i mean i know that whoever is the client who wants to use that standard needs to also um in any way engage with all these parties that are not part of the pool and since they are in bilateral negotiations they can probably as you said get a higher price so to me it would only make sense for someone to join a pool who estimates that his individual license value that he would get would be smaller than what he can get from the from the share in the pool right which would in itself lead to an outcrowding that basically only let's say the non valuable patents will in the end survive in the pool whereas everyone who is kind of believing in the, in the value of their patents will, will kind of stay out of it. You see what I'm saying? And, yeah, and, and, and actually, Fabian, what you describe has been the situation for many pools and many cases where the pools fail because it, you can call it the pools of the lemons, right? All the, the crappy patents ended in the pool <laughs> because the patent owners didn't believe in them and they said, okay, you can try, but I don't have much, you know. But um, that, that is very true. Um, and for years, that is also why pools were not really successful because companies like Nokia, Ericsson, Qualcomm, they had big licensing teams. So really professional people, hundreds of people in those divisions that were really professional and they knew how to close deals and to get the money in. So why would they you know, take their in-house teams that are so good and so successful and give that to a pool, right? There was, as you said, they, the, the estimation was, we probably get more money and royalties if we do it bilaterally. Um, however, still, 
it is still a lot of work and it is a lot of delay. And if the licensee in the end doesn't agree to your contract, you have to go to court. And that also means a lot of investment before you actually get your money. So you have to have a lot of funds and you have to have, as I said, a professional team to do it. And Avanci is covering a market that they haven't worked with either, right? The, the professionals from Nokia know how to close a deal with Apple. It's, it's easy. It's a cross license. It's, it's, a, it's a handset. It's, 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 they have done it since 2G, 3G, now 4G and soon 5G. How to approach an automotive company is a much different deal. Um, and that is why they outsourced that. They said, okay, it's probably more efficient if we, if we let um, a third party do it, who built up resources, who set up you know, a system, um, and who came up with a model that doesn't, you know, we don't need to worry about it. You know, we, can, we give them their patents. They can only sell to the automotive market. So we keep doing our bilateral licensing in the handset and smartwatches and tablet market, but they do the automotive market. And we see how it works. And that is actually the success of Avanci um, that they actually, I mean, people didn't believe in it because of that same reason you gave Fabian, but they made it successful. And it's, it's, it's quite astonishing that they succeeded, to be honest. Many people didn't believe in it. So good, 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 good things they did there. I, by, by the way, there's a, I, I'm doing a podcast where I'm interviewing one of the VPs at Avanci and I ask him the exact same question. So if you search your Spotify or Apple podcast for the SCP couch, I, I interview that guy there. So it's, it's something you should consider listening to. But yes, uh, <clears throat> true. Um, yeah, let's, let's, uh, I prepared one case study um, to tell you or give you some idea of how much is really at stake um, because standard central patents, you know, they're really lucrative and you see how much money people and companies spend to get access, to buy them, to license, these kind of things. And there's a big case um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not a recent one, but still an interesting. <clears throat> Google entered the smartphone market um, by acquiring a company, an operating system company, actually a startup called Android. Many people don't know it. Android wasn't developed directly by Google. It's a startup they acquired, <clears throat> which is great. Um, it became the dominant operating mobile system and it actually kicked out Microsoft from the market, as many of you know. In 2009, Google as a company owned 170 patent families compared to Microsoft, 8,000 patent families. So, you know, Google is a small you know, player in terms of patents. Microsoft, one of the largest in the world. In 2010, and that is an interesting fact, Microsoft generated more revenue through patent royalties from Google's Android than through its own mobile MS operating system. So you know Microsoft Mobile is a Microsoft operating system. They try to get it into BlackBerry and their own devices and other devices, not really successful. But how did they get now revenue from Android, right? That's that's puzzling, probably, because you all think Android is open source, and you know why? Why would that you know infringe any patents? Well, it is partly open source. That is true, but it infringed it, or it did infringe a lot of Microsoft mobile patents because Android was a startup back then. They created great technology, but you know they didn't file patents, and Microsoft patented anything, right? They patented so broad that. Android in the end infringed a lot of the Microsoft patents. So what they did is they, you know, they went to Google, they, they did realize, oh, Android gets successful. Uh, in order to, to try to block them or at least get some money out of the market, they offered a license to the patents. So Microsoft generated a lot of royalty income from those patents that Android infringed. And of course, that's not a nice situation for Google. They are highly successful, but a large share of the revenue goes to the unsuccessful Microsoft just because of the patent, right? This is, this is what really pissed my Google up. So um, in 2009, there was uh, suddenly a, com a company called Nortel. Many of you may not know that anymore. It's a, um, a networking technology company from, from Canada. Um, and they uh, announced bankruptcy. And why is that interesting? They had one of the largest standard central patent portfolios in the market, right? So Google said, oh, that is great. Um, and, you know, typically, I don't know if you know, bankruptcy cases, typically you sell um, the business. And what they did here, the, the, the bankruptcy managers, they, they sold the business separate from the patent portfolio. You could buy either the business or the patents or both, right? So what, this was a closed bidding, but you knew who submitted a bid. So Google was the first to submit a bid and no one knew about it. I have the number here. It was 900 million for, just for the patent portfolio. 
Um, but that announcement that Google, you know, proposed a bid on that patent portfolio created fear in the eyes of the new competitors of Google. Google just entered the smartphone market. So Apple, Microsoft, Sony, BlackBerry, they said, oh no, Android was so successful. If they own that portfolio now, we cannot even go after them with patents anymore because we use a lot of the Nortel patents. They know that, of course. They also had partly licenses to those, but they were really scared. So they created a consortium called the Rockstar Consortium. And the Rockstar Consortium is basically, you know, those players got, got together and said, you know, we don't know how much money Google put in in their bid, but we have to make sure we win it. So they put in 4.5 billion, right? So a lot more than Google actually bid to just win it. And obviously they won it because 4.5 4 billion is the same much money. But that's, you know, just to, to let you understand how much the standard central patent portfolio of one single company was valued at 1.5 billion. Just the portfolio, not the, not the business. And here you can see from that bidding, which companies bid it on the business and which companies bid it on the patent portfolio. And on the left-hand side, you see it's, it's only Ericsson that said, okay, we want the company and the patents. All the others either just wanted the patents or the business. The business was much cheaper than the patents. That's also why. <clears throat> so Google lost the bid, right? And the Rockstar Consortium won the bid. So still the big players own all the patents. However, next case, Motorola Mobility. Motorola Mobility wasn't bankrupt yet, but it looked very, you know, likely they will get soon bankrupt. <clears throat> so um, with that in mind, Google said, let's just acquire Motorola, right? We acquire the whole business. I don't care. We only want the patents, but we acquire the whole business, you know, just to get now a, a foot in the market. We have just a hundred patents. Everyone is going to fight us. We're not going to make any revenue. So we need patents. And um, again, here, Google did a bit on, on Motorola. Um, they approached them and they paid 63% over the market capitalization of a company that was estimated to go bankrupt very soon. Not to get the devices of Motorola, you know, not to get the Razer Google. That's what people thought in the beginning. No, all they wanted is the patent portfolio. You can see that because they sold the Motorola business just two, two years later to Lenovo. But, you know, they, they paid 12.5 billion for Motorola, a company that wasn't really successful anymore, just to get the patents. And what did they do? Motorola owned a lot of patents for 3G, 4G, but also in particular for Wi-Fi. <clears throat> so as I told you in the beginning, Microsoft got most of the revenue from Android. Um, Google went back on Microsoft. And what Google did, because they were actually afraid of marketing, they said, if Google now goes out and sues companies, that may look bad. So they kept Motorola as 100% subsidiary and made Motorola you know, go to litigation against the companies. And the first one they targeted was Microsoft. So they said, okay, Microsoft is infringing our Wi-Fi patents. And what kind of hardware is Microsoft shipping out? It's the Xbox, right? Um, and they asked from Microsoft $4.48 per device and compared the, the, the chip, the computer chip that does all the graphical processing, that does all the heavy work of, of a gaming console, is worth between three and four dollars. So they asked just for the fraction of Wi-Fi patents. Obviously, Motorola didn't own all of them. Already, four point four eight dollars. So you see how outrageous the request was. So obviously, they went to litigation on it. This year, another example. They asked different rates for the Xbox with four G gigabyte and two hundred fifty gigabyte gigabytes, um, and they asked like enormously a lot of money. Also here for so-called H. 264 patents, these are video uh, compression standards, also you use in a, in a console. And, and also these prices were outrageous. <clears throat> um, and in the end, just to, to let you know how that ended, um, Motorola won actually, or Google won uh, in the name of Motorola. They didn't get four, but they got, I think $2.5 per device. So they got a lot of money back from Microsoft um, from licensing those, um, you know, Xboxes. So Google basically had to make a statement. If you go after us, you, we go after you. And they did it. That was actually the beginning of what many people call the smartphone, war, smartphone wars, where anything, you know, all the competitors went to litigation, fought each other on patents and cross-licensing and all that. And a lot of times, standard essential patents were part of it. But, you know, that case study is one 
I, I think where most money was spent on standard essential patents ever. But yeah, one of the examples. But how, you know, that was the smartphone wars. The smartphone wars probably like 10 years ago started in that area. Um, still going on, but not as heavy as, as now. Um, because now we have a, another battlefield um, and the press calls it the automotive, the new SEP battlefields. Because companies like Daimler, just recently Volkswagen, Tesla, um, Continental, all of BMW, all of these companies are right now in litigation against companies like Nokia, Broadcom, Sharp, Conversant about standard essential patents because they are implementing more and more connectivity standards in their cars um, and they often do not pay a license and they often do not pay a license also to Avanci, right? They have an offering. Avanci wants $15 for 2G, 3G, 4G and they're not paying. You know, for example, the biggest case that was in the market was Nokia against Daimler that went on for three years and um, just summer last 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 year Nokia and um, um, Daimler settled but people you know say actually Daimler lost it uh, lost the case they paid they had to pay Daimler and they now had to also join Avanci so they got forced into joining the patent pool because otherwise all the other Avanci members would go after Daimler they would go litigation after litigation. So Daimler lost a lot of money on the litigation. Now Volkswagen is the next. Volkswagen also, they, um, they have Audi cars and Porsche cars licensed under Avanci, but they didn't license all the other Volkswagen smaller priced cars because Avanci asked $15, no matter how much worse the car is. And of course, in the marginal cost, $15 for a Golf is much more than for a Porsche SUV, right? So that is why they yet licensed only the premium brands. So right now litigation has really shifted from the smartphone world to the first industry vertical that is basically attacked by the SEP owners and that's the automotive industry. <clears throat> and the big question here is, and I think that's one of the first questions Elena had, um, is the value chain. Um, why is there, a, and people call, call that a clash of cultures. In the communication industry, it's very well known. Typically OEMs license with OEMs, Apple, and Samsung or Huawei and Nokia, right? It's on the OEM level, they don't involve the supply chain. That's a very common way of how to license standard essential patents in the communication industry. In the manufacturing industry, very different. Um, typically any patents that exist there um, that let's say a supplier has um, and that sells to the OEM is part of the whole indemnification, meaning you, you can get my device, you know, free from third party rights. So if Continental sells a connectivity box to Daimler, they have to sign a contract. This is, you know, free from third party rights. Uh, if you use that connectivity box, you can use all the IP um, that is, is central to that box, right? And with SEPs, Continental got a problem because they did sign indemnification, but now, um, you know, Daimler got litigated against Nokia um, and Daimler is infringing the patents. Um, so they have to pay Nokia, but they now go back to Continental trying to get back the money. But that's the big, big problem that is existing right now. And Daimler doesn't want to do it. Uh, Continental cannot pay. They go out of business if they pay the whole. Uh, so they have to share the price of it. So there's, there's the big discussion. And in the end, um, it's also a discussion of the mechanism of how, how to license. Because of course, the practice in the market is that you go after the vehicle, right? You go after the OEMs, but why not license the component? Would make a lot of more sense because if you think about it, going after each single product, especially when you think about IoT, you know, every small startup that produces one intelligent device using 5G, you have to go after the whole market. And with IoT, this market will go big, 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 and you have a huge long tail. Even for the SEP owners, it will be difficult to track. So licensing the chip manufacturer makes a lot more sense, but they fear, the SP owners fear, that is, it's a disadvantage because a chip worth just three, four dollars, you cannot ask for a $15 license, right? I mean, that would be outrageous. $15 for a car is not outrageous. It's a car wash of, of what, what some people argue. So it, it's, it's also a, a question of how much, how, what, what kind of prices you can ask. Um, and of course, then the question is also about the mechanism. Should it be a percentage of the final product price or a lump sum? So Avanci, the patent pool, said, uh, we don't care about how much you sell your car for. We want $15 no matter what, right? So it, $15 is not much for, as I said, 100,000 
dollar Porsche, maybe, but a lot for a smaller Volkswagen, you know, medium sized car, which is worth maybe 30,000, right? So it's a, it's, it's a different marginal um, price to it. Um, and, you know, all these questions that are set up here, should the basis be the product or the component? Should it be a, a lump sum or a percentage? Should it be the OEM or supplier? Should it be a patent pool or bilateral license? And what is reasonable? All of these issues are not solved in the market yet. They are litigated on, they are discussed in the European Commission on the regulatory side. They're discussed in court, um, in Germany, in the US, in China, and all these different jurisdictions. So there's a big challenge right now to get some idea of how this will be solved. <clears throat> to give you some numbers on litigation, again, this is taken from the IPLytics database. Um, you know, 4G was the most litigated standard in the past. I mean, I, I think 5G will take over, but you know, 5G is not as much implemented yet as 4G is. Um, the, the strongest litigators, meaning those companies that go to court um, here are all the strong SAP owners, obviously, Nokia, Ericsson, Qualcomm, Huawei, and the others. These are mo the most named plaintiffs um, that we see in our database. And then um, a result from a questionnaire we did, uh, who will drive the litigation? And here, you know, most of the industry experts said 40%, it will be the SAP owners. Um, followed by patent pools and also those patent assertion entities. I told you in the beginning, if you are an SCP owner, you may not want to go to court and enforce your patent. You sell it to an entity, call them patent trolls, call them patent assertion entities, and they do it for you. So these are the expectations um, from, from a questionnaire we have. Um, and also interestingly, if those patents actually go to court, do courts always decide that these patents are really essential and valid? And in 49 of the percentages, when it goes to court and when there's a decision, patents, as essential patents were actually found not essential, right? So experts were able to prove these patents are not chartable. Um, and um, only in 27%, we had an infringement. And then, you know, all the other percentages here are different causes for invalid and validity. Basically, the patent wasn't novel. And that often is, and also here, um, we provide some data to that sometimes, is um, that someone in some standards meeting already presented the idea before it was filed as a patent. And we track at, at Apolytics all these contributions. So that is you know, one thing that we do data-wise also to support invalidating patents supposedly essential. Um, yeah, here's another study. Um, uh, I, I have, again, the source here in the slide um, of, of some researchers that looked at, they call them non-practicing entities, again, same as PAEs or patent trolls that are, you know, often responsible for a lot of litigation. Um, and, you know, also here, um, what is interesting, most of the cases never end in a, in a decision in court, it, they end in settlement, same as a Nokia Daimler case ended in a settlement. So we do not know what really has been agreed upon. We just know they had to sign something. Um, a question, Eric. Uh, yeah, uh, on the, um, for the court decisions, um, as far as I know, patents are always regional, right? They're not like, uh, they're not global patents. Um, most of the time they're um, for specific regions. And obviously the, the courts that decide are not able to decide for the entire world, but rather just for the own respective region, for example, the US courts. Um, so is it the case that um, license fees or royalties are different for each region? Like, can you, can you, like if you have patents for a technology, if you are an SEP holder, do you have different fees for different regions? Um, do you charge differently? Yeah, implementers want that, right? This is often a, a negotiation also, um, but it doesn't make sense, actually. Think about one case. You have an iPhone, right? Um, and Apple has the license for Germany, right? Uh, they paid the license, but they failed to pay the license for UK, right? You go to the UK now with your phone, you cannot use 5G anymore in UK because it hasn't been licensed. So discussing a local license on an often globally used device is something that doesn't make sense often, right? I mean, in Europe, if, if it's a European patent, you can argue, but most of the EP patents are probably also not, uh, you know, uh, have also different local courts. A French court decides different than a German court. So licensing SEPs actually makes, in a business side of things, only sense globally. While a court, you're 100% right, can only look at local patents. Still though, we had some decisions in the UK courts that 
they define the friend rate, a global friend rate. Um, but there is this problem of we need global rates. Everything else doesn't make sense. With local courts, this is the only way to enforce, right? So we don't have super uh, international courts. So what happens right now, if you're not happy with one court decision, you go to another court. So we had situations where companies were not happy with the UK court decision. They went to China and you know said you know I, I I'm, I'm setting up a, a court um, case on against the decision in the UK right and that is a very bad situation so we have different co courts across the world that that decide and try to negotiate and find a solution for a global license but to my knowledge um, still those those deals that do not go to court are not differentiating of different regions. They always are global friend licenses across all countries. So there's not a situation where you, you know, or there's also no price differentiation. It's always a globe. I mean, if you argue your phones are only used in Germany, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, and typically it's not the case also, but you always typically have to, to sign a global rate. But yeah, it's, it is, you could argue, and maybe there's also cases where it does make sense, where you only sell in local market and you pay less, but typically it's not. <clears throat> Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, the problem is we don't have much more, more time, but I think we talked a lot about, or um, you asked good questions and I talked a lot about the challenges already. So I go through that a little bit faster. I think one of the big challenges right now with IoT is that the implementers, the automotive industry, um, the manufacturing industry, the energy industry, even or healthcare industry, all those industries that will now newly integrate those communication technologies have little knowledge about how to license SEPs. And that is the challenge. And pools like Avanci try to solve that. They try to make it easier having just one $15 you pay and you're good, right? So that, that because there's a lot of challenges that need to be solved in, in that regard. Um, what is what I also learned, not only for the licensees, but also for the licensors, when you talk to those people, it is a lot more challenging to collect royalties outside of the smartphone world where they haven't, you know, best practices. Also in licensing SEPs, and often argument is a comparable license. So basically, if Samsung goes to Apple for a license, uh, Apple argues, you know, this is a comparable rate I also gave to Ericsson. So here's the contract we have with them. Please also sign our contract because we have another market player that agreed to the terms. And typically also courts accept that because of course, if you, you know, signed a contract with a comparable market player, why not asking for the same rates with another player? All that doesn't exist if you're newly licensed to an industry that has never signed any SEP contracts. So that is also why the SEP owners, you know, find it more beneficial that a patent pool solves this, that they aggregate packages. And also think about the future of IoT where all these small companies, the long tail of the market, you know, you don't want to chase each and every single business. So there needs to be so solutions in the market that everyone gets a license much more easier. The Berlin startup will never enter a bilateral ne negotiation with, with Nokia. They don't have the money. They cannot probably even afford one single attorney. So what would make it easy to get money from them? And also you don't want the, the Berlin startup to be out of business because then you cannot collect any royalties in the future because they want the, the startup to go big and then collect royalties when they make the real money. So having you know, solutions where that Berlin startup could go to a patent pool um, and sign a contract for the next five years that any device they sell, you know, they pay $15. And then, you know, let's say hockey stick, that startup goes big, you know, the pool gets a lot of money from them. So that one stop easy solutions is also what SAP owners want in the market. And, but it will be a challenge to set that up actually. Eric. Um, you just started to touch on a topic that is like really uh, important for me and, and, and is a fear of mine whenever we talk about uh, standard essential patterns. And it's always a question like, when you look at the, um, the charts that you present, all these companies, they are like the biggest of big players in the world, right? And uh, they are the ones that participate in standard essential patterns. So my question is basically, um, does it exclude like all these small players from those kind of technologies? So is standard essential patterns a way to sort of gatekeep um, these technologies for the big players? 
And um, is that something that is realistic or can a startup essentially just bank on the fact that they're too small to pursue and then eventually uh, enter the market at a later point maybe? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think there has been a lot of criticism in that di exact direction. You know, it's only the big players that have the large portfolios. Um, still, one has to say that, especially nowadays, where everything is virtual, standards development is open, right? If you are a startup and you're really developing 5G technology, you can, you can contribute and you can be part of standards development. There's no gate or also the member fees are free for startups. So we are, as iPolitics, even 3GPP members, not because we develop the standards, we just want to get some data, but um, it's really, it's free and it's open. Um, so that is good, but still you need the people and the engineers to make a difference and filing a patent is even more expensive. You need a patent attorney and all that, right? I I mean, obviously you cannot go to the level as the big players. Um, also, the second point is true. No one will chase a startup. I mean, there's not enough money in it to, to make them pay anything and they go out of business. It's, it's, you know, no one has any advantage of that. Even more patent pools typically have rules that the first 20,000 sold devices are for free. It's a very typical common thing that the, you know, you sign a license and you get everything for free up to a certain amount of, of sold devices or you know, chips or whatever it is. So there's a lot of these contracts that are beneficial for startups. But you know, of course, when the startup picks up, they pay a lot of money back to those players. So you can always argue back and forth what is fair here, but it, in the end, it's a market, obviously. And you also have to say that Companies like Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, Qualcomm, they spend billions of dollars in the staff in sending the people and developing and doing R&D. So, you know, it's, it's of course also their investment that they want to get, you know, compensated for. But yeah, it's still a criticism in the market. In Germany, um, the Dean, the German Institute of Standardization actually has a program that um, gives you funding if you are, you, if you want to participate in standards development. So they you know, if you have a project you want to integrate in standards development, they help you and they fund it and they support you. But it must be in, in the German standards development organization, <laughs> not in CGPP. But yeah, that's the way it works. Thank you. Yeah, um, the final slides, maybe the future. Um, I'm, <clears throat> and that is probably also very quickly what we do at iPolitics. Um, any company, may that be the SEP owner, May that be the implementer, maybe not the startup yet, but all the companies that are active. And that's basically any R&D active company in the world will have, and to some extent, will have to do something with standards and patents in the, in the near future. Um, tracking which patents are valid, in which jurisdiction, in which countries, who owns the patents. Patents get sold a lot. Um, who has been in litigation before. Um, all these kind of information we basically track at iPolitics to allow companies to make strategic decisions. <clears throat> and I'm skipping some of the, 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 the takeaways here, but basically what we answer for our clients is we tell you who owns how many patents on 5G, who sold recently packages of patents to a patent troll. Should you be worried that patent troll is following you soon? Are these actually, patents actually still active or have they dropped the patents in some jurisdictions? Are they granted or have they been rejected by the office? You know, have they been in litigation before? So you can expect litigation also in the future. Um, and we do that for patent data, but we, could, we do that also for standards data, right? We can track which standards organizations develop 5G, who has participated at the meetings because the companies that go to the meetings are the future patent owners. Um, so our customers are all the large companies, of course, the Samsungs, the Huaweis, the Apples, they all use it to, you know, track competition, to go into licensing, cross-licensing negotiations. But we also have more and more clients on the other side, the licensees. So um, companies like Daimler or Toyota or Denso are clients that use our software to, you know, understand the market, um, understand that they are in a situation where they have to pay SEP licenses in the near future. And what we do is we give access to data to support decision-making. So you see some of the screen shared here on the right-hand side. We also track patent pooling, of course, um, so you can understand how much share an Avanci pool has, how much share an AGVC pool has. <clears throat> 
Um, yes, and um, that is basically what we offer as a software. So it's a software you subscribe to, a yearly software subscription, user-based. So we sell to a company like Huawei, 30 licenses in the you know, R&D department, patent department, licensing department, sometimes even litigation department. So it supports their you know, decision-making um, for various questions that regard licensing, but also earlier in the R&D process of how to file an essential patent. Yeah, that's who we are at IPlytics, and I hope you enjoyed that lecture. Um, we are, you know, one minute over already, but thanks for your great questions. Should you have any other questions, I unfortunately have a hard stop here, but um, email me. My email is poman at ipolytics.com. Uh, you can also send it to info. Actually, someone reads the info emails also at IPlytics. But also, as I said, you can also follow uh, the podcast that we recently set up since November last year, which is called the SEP Couch. Uh, you can also search my name on Spotify or Apple Podcast. You will find it. Um, and I interview some of the industry experts. Uh, it's quite interesting for those of you who are interested in the topic. So get some insights there as well. But thank you. Thank you. <laughs>